Hello and uh, welcome to the latest tutorial. This is on CP Bach Solfeggio or the Solfeggetto as it's more popularly known. Uh, this is part of the series on the easiest pieces to play for grade six, uh, to pass grade six piano. Um, um, I have recorded this already. I put this up on YouTube a few days ago. People who may have watched that may have gone, grade six? That seems incredibly difficult for grade six. I've got to emphasize that the way that I played that is quite a bit beyond grade six. I'll come to that in a minute. So by the way, yesterday <laughs> I, spent, I spent two hours recording this tutorial three times and every single time there was some kind of mishap. So by now I'm a little bit um, uh, punch drunk <laughs> of, of recording this thing, so I hope it works. If you like this tutorial, please do like it, uh, subscribe to the channel, uh, show some appreciation because, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm really working hard to, to try and get this out there. Um, it's been a little while since I last did the tutorial, so anyway. Um, fundamentally, this is a really easy piece. Um, we've got that and then, which is really similar, and then really similar. This is a little bit different and then it's all the same. There's so much repetition in this thing. Um, and um, yeah, I'll come, I'll come in a minute to the absolute easiest way to learn this thing. Now, when I played it, I'm, I'm basically just sick of hearing all the time everyone play it loudly, fast, and just going... You know, blah, 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 blah. Um, um, by the way, it's been a few days since I did it and it was only in my short-term memory. So um, that's the way most people play it. And um, it's, um, it's, it's one of those pieces like um, you, you just hear it so often and, and like fur release, you know, that it's one of these pieces that teachers go, oh my God, because it's just done so often. So um, what I liked is this sort of very light, very hyper staccato version where if you slow it down, etc etc as opposed to everything just being legato legato is absolutely the easy easy way to play this thing whereas so i mean what do you prefer do you prefer legato the normal way not try and play it nicely you know I'll try and so um, or super super light quiet and very very staccato so you know I know which one I prefer and this is more in keeping in, in the way that it would have been played uh, at the time where the, the, the school of technique was uh, everything was just done with the fingertips, um, um, this kind of thing. But it is hard. That is seriously, seriously difficult. Um, it's only been something that I've tried doing very, very recently, the, this kind of pulling with the fingers approach. Um, and I last spoke about it on the Haydn video that, that I did for ABRSM grade eight um, recently. So I'm not going to talk about that straight away. I'm going to talk about the easy way to, to play this thing, which is super legato. So um, people who've watched my other videos will know that I have a, a method called shifting accents. Uh, for a long time, I'd never heard anyone else call it by that. But since then, there are teachers out there who do call it shifting accents um, and it's a, it's a very similar kind of thing. So basically what we do, we, we start with very small chunks, like maybe half a bar, one bar, maybe even one beat. Um, I'm going to start just with bar one. And what we do, we start with groups of two and we go one, two, one, two, where the one is super, super loud and the two is super, super quiet. We really want to exaggerate these differences. So we start with the first note, we go one, two, 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 one. Go slowly, really go slowly in the beginning. Then we shift the accents along. 
So we still start on the same note. We still start on that E flat, but we start on the two. So we go quiet, two, one, 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 two, one. Um, this is difficult. Everyone finds this difficult in the beginning. Then you go to groups of three. So you do one, two, three, where one is loud, two and three are quiet, and you want the quiet ones to be equally quiet, and you want the loud, the loud ones to be equally loud. So we then have one, two, three, 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 one. Then we shift it along. We start on the three, three, one, two, 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 three. Then we start on the two, two, three, one, 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 two. Then we do groups of four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. That's the boring one. Don't spend long on that one. Then start on four, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. Um, if you do this, you're just going to be able to go. This is my go-to way of learning things in, in a constant stream of notes that are very, very fast. It's, it's such a quick way of getting under the fingers. Now, basically where everyone goes wrong, where I see my students go wrong over and over again, there's a few things. There's an impatience. So say we're doing it in groups of three, people can get impatient and start going. And you can hear that just that is not that, that extreme contrast. So take it slower. And you can really hear the difference. It's hard. And when you first start doing it, you might start doing things like, and then go, ah, <laughs> or just carry on. You'll, you'll do things like one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, and just go, ah. But no, you have to get it right. So, you know, if you have to, slow it right down to something like. And even that, even that might still be too fast in the beginning. So, you know, the, the, you might feel like, oh my God, I can't do this, I'm, I'm rubbish. Just slow it down. The, the important thing is that you get it right in this kind of loud, quiet, quiet kind of way. Um, because in the beginning, it, it will be difficult. Um, and by the way, an, another way that my students go wrong is they try and do this for memory. So if, if they can kind of play this slowly by memory, they then try and go one, two, three, one, and they try and do it for memory. Do not do it for memory. Follow on the page so that you can see loud, quiet, quiet, loud, quiet, quiet, loud, quiet, and you follow on the page. Um, so what this means is that in the beginning, it will be really hard and you have to think, you've got to think about the numbers. One, two, three, one, two. But you'll find that after a while, if you do this for 10, 15 minutes a day, you'll find that after a certain amount of days, your ear and your fingers will just start going one, two, three, one, two, three, da, 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 and then da, 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 and you'll start to get an intuitive shortcut. Your brain sort of reorganizes all the neurons. So, so it goes, I know how to make this easier. And that's the magic moment. That's the magic moment when your brain suddenly kind of gets it under the fingers and goes, oh, it's just this. And without doing that, uh, most people will just spend ages reading and going and, and thinking about every note. So basically, you know, I was chatting about this with one of my students yesterday because she was saying she, she never really wants to do this. And I never really feel like, I, I never have the feeling, oh, what I want to do is shifting accent practice today. But because of my life experience, I know that if I've got, well, even this piece, where, when I learned this last week, if I, wanted, if I want to get it quickly under my fingers, the absolute quickest way is, is just to do these shifting accents. So then I spend, you know, five minutes, because um, I'm, you know, reasonably good. I, I can, you know, do groups of five. Uh, let me go a little slower. So 
So, you know, that's me doing it in groups of five. It's not too difficult for me, but in the beginning, it was really, really difficult. So, you know, I sit down, do the shifting accent practice and boom, boom. It's just there, it's just there under my fingers without that. Um, and, and I remember, you know, when I started looking at this a week ago, it's because of the way that the hands switch over. I, I didn't just sit down and go like that. I was like, oh, it's this, um, and then that. You know, it, 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 I didn't just sit down and immediately, boom, you know, play it. Um, it's not sight readable for me. Um, so this shifting accent practice is so quick and easy to get it under the fingers. And as I said to my student, would you rather just spend 10 minutes every day doing something that feels uncomfortable and a little bit annoying and not that much fun? Or would you rather spend hours and hours sort of slowly, slowly building up the speed um, and just getting frustrated at how long it takes to speed it up? I know, I know which I would rather do. And, and that's why I do the shifting accent practice. Although sometimes I really do have to give myself a push. But you know, you're just gonna have to take it on trust on faith from me, that if you sit down and practice in that way, you're gonna radically speed up how you learn it. And another place where people go wrong, they'll, they'll try and go like this. And, and just do a giant chunk, don't do that, don't do that. Just work on a very, very small bit. Um, it may be even just this. And then, um, uh, and that, you know, I was doing it with, uh, I think it'll be clearer on the second beat. So here's the second beat. And then shift it in threes. And then, and then in threes, I loop it just to save time. And then groups of four, that's the boring one. Start on the four, uh, start on the three. Now, the, the, the point of this is that then you'll very quickly be able to go. And also, I do this instead of metronome work. Metronomes are there really to sort of get a very, very even taka, 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 taka. Now, if you do this kind of practice where you're going one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, you're going to get that evenness. And it makes every single finger equally um, loud and equally quiet. So, so it's good to, to fix when the fourth finger is a little bit weak and a little bit muddy. So, you know, I, I can't recommend this enough. Um, you, you have to do this. Um, if you want to learn this just easily and effortlessly. I say effortlessly, it's obviously a little bit of effort, but if it feels effortful to you, you're going too fast. Um, I mean, it's gonna take a little bit of focus and concentration in the beginning, but ideally you wanna be going one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, two, three, one. And do I look like I'm working really hard? If I do this, Oh, let me try and take it even faster. That starts to become effort. Don't do that, just be patient. Uh, as I was saying <laughs> in one of the um, tutorials I, I tried to record yesterday that then went totally wrong, impatience is the enemy of anybody who's learning a musical instrument. Um, you feel it in the body. There's, there's this feeling of impatience. If you don't recognize that there's a feeling of impatience and then just go, ah, oh, and, you, and, and you get hooked by it and, and it becomes compulsive, this is why you'll find it takes way longer to learn something. If you feel that impatience, you've just got to go, I feel it, I see you, and you just slow down. That takes a lot of discipline. That, that's not effort, but, but discipline and intention. Anyway, that's for a completely different video. So... Um, um, yeah, so once, it, once you've got, um, now this might seem like, oh my God, but it'll take me forever to learn that piece if I do that. Bear in mind that once you can do this, it's not massively different to then do this. And then it's the same thing here. This is different. And then it's all the same there. You've got a new section here. And by the way, you know, do practice this as well. 
Uh, whoops. Um, and if you do all the shifting accents, you know. Um, um, and it's really good for all the evenness as well, so you don't just go... Um, uh, you know, and so on and so on. Then you've got the same as the beginning here in G minor. Um, and by that time you'll realize, oh, I can already play all of that. Then it happens again in bar 17 in F minor. And you'll go, oh, I can play all of that. And then it comes back again at the end. Um, so, you know, you'll, you'll find that once you do all that work in the first bar, then the second bar becomes easier, then the third and fourth bar are the same, and then even though bar five is completely different, your ear is still going to start to get used to the, 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 the kind of way that you're doing this. Basically, it, it just massively, massively uh, speeds up how you're going to learn it. So, um, something I do recommend as well, um, and I should have followed my own advice and done this before I recorded it and put it up on YouTube, and I'm a bit embarrassed I didn't do this. Um, I downloaded the, uh, the actual manuscript in C.P. Bach's own writing, which is amazing that we can do that these days so easily. Um, and, uh, and here it is, you can, you can look at the original manuscript. Um, and then you'll, you'll, you want to look at whatever edition that you're using and make sure, is, was this in the original manuscript? Um, and I assumed in my modern edition that, that I downloaded off IMSLP, I assumed, oh, I'd, I'll ignore those because I don't think they were in the original. And they were in the original, and I, I really should have looked before I recorded it, but anyway. Now, one thing that um, is really, really um, uh, difficult is that in the original, it has this weird ending. It has this weird ending that just goes, and then that's it. So if I play it, if I try and play it quickly, I uh, don't know if I'll be able to do this, but if I try and play quickly from bar 31, um, yeah. It's like, what? It's like we just went off the cliff and was like, huh? Well, it's very, very weird. Um, and so that's why that uh, um, there is another edition that does something like... Um, it does something weird like that. Um, um, uh, and I'm guessing that most of you out there will probably have th that edition. C.P. Buck didn't write that. Uh, and when I was recording all these tutorials yesterday, um, I basically had not gone and done my research of where that ending comes from. Um, I've now done my research <laughs> after three attempts uh, uh, at recording it, which, uh, which all went wrong. So basically, I found here um, uh, is uh, oh yeah. By the way, the the title of this piece is Solfeggio, but everyone knows it by Solfeggetto. So basically, this charming little piece originally ended halfway through the final bar on top C, uh, which is this I played. It just goes, which is very odd sounding. So a century later, Bertold Tours issued a version of the piece in which he renamed it Solfeggetto and added a totally unnecessary half bar, which brings the piece to rest on middle C. Now, in my opinion, it's completely needed. You can't just finish it there. It just doesn't work. But whoever wrote this, they're, they're very snooty about this. Um, uh, this glaringly obvious addition has been retained by nearly all later editors, none of whom seems to have taken the trouble to refer to Bach's own edition. Um, an American edition... Uh, did so did go so far as to put the offending final notes in small type. And to be honest, most of the editions that I see that have that, they are in small type, um, but without offering any opinion as, their, uh, as to their authenticity. It grieves me to state that the associated board edition of this piece, grade six, is just as inaccurate as the rest. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. So but it does not reflect much credit upon all the other editors of this piece that such wide currency has been given to such a vulgar and tasteless edition. <laughs> and you know, what I was saying um, in um, the, the tutorials yesterday is like, yes, it was added by a romantic um, uh, composer, at least uh, I, I have no idea who this um, uh, who was the guy here? Bertolt Tours. I have no idea who, who that is. But uh, uh, anyway, as far as I was aware, it had been added by a, by a romantic composer. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if you're going to play a version which, which uh, doesn't just finish, you can do anything you want. It doesn't have to go... Uh, let, let me actually just bring it up. Let me bring up what that version is. Uh, um, oh, yes, here we go. So, so we've got... 
Um, oh, and then it's the left hand. Um, I mean, that, that isn't great either. Now, let me see if I can play it reasonably fast. Um, uh, um, it's not really much better. Um, there is another edition by, um, is it um, Sauer? Uh, Emil von Sauer or something like that. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna, I, I think it's him. Anyway, I'll put, I'll put links to all of this in the, in the description. Um, uh, and his version, it's not bad. So we've got... Um, um, da, 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 da. <laughs> it's not very Baroque. Um, uh, what did he do? Um, yeah, not very Baroque at all. So basically, uh, let me just talk you through what I decided. Um, and bear in mind, do absolutely, absolutely bear in mind that um, in C.P. Bach's time, you were expected to improvise. You were expected to add ornamentation. If you just followed only what was on the page, you were not considered to be a good musician. Um, so what, what I'm doing in this piece is very much in the spirit of what C.P. Bach would have expected and what any musician would have done in C.P. Bach's time. I don't know if they would have done exactly the things that I've done, but I've done things very much in the spirit of, of Baroque music. So if we go... I was baffled for a while. Why has C.P. Bach written this? Why did he not write it with some kind of... Um, um, you know, kind of thing. And then it's like, okay, he obviously wants something abruptly to finish there. But because it was totally normal to add trills and ornaments, I'm thinking, well, what about... Uh, and, and actually, without this, because I added that in the left hand as well, you could finish it without that. So let me just go from bar 31. That seems like, yeah, that kind of works. That that almost completely works. And then when I add that, then it really works for me. Um, and then it gives it that sudden, that sudden ending. Um, so you can watch my version on YouTube. Uh, I'll put the, the, the link above. Uh, just watch that and you can slow it down. You can slow it down to half speed. You can slow it down to quarter speed. Bear in mind that it's a little bit dicey if you do something like that for your grade six ABRSM. Um, although I think any half decent examiner will know, well, it's Baroque music. Of course you can add your own ornamentation. Um, if you actually have an in-person exam and you take your sheet music, you can then write it in and then it's obvious that, you know, this is done on purpose. However, if you do that kind of thing, you've got to be really good with your trills and maybe, maybe that kind of trilling is a bit beyond grade six. But what I encourage you to do is to experiment and just to try different things. You can, you can literally write your own ending. So it could be something like, uh, let me genuinely try and do something completely different. Uh, it's not very Baroque, that's more kind of classical, but in my opinion, it's still better than the way that it finishes. Or, um... Um... Mm, yeah, I'm not sure, but anyway, you know, I, I would spend a little bit of time and go, well, how would I like to finish this thing? Because, you know, everyone just plays it all the time, just going, um... Um, yeah, I, I've forgotten what that other version was, but, um... You know, what, if you're going to do that, you can do whatever you want. Anyway, so something else that I've done, because bear in mind that when C.P. Bach wrote this, there was no piano in the way that, that we recognize and hear the, a modern piano. His, his piano, um, it, it, it had only just been invented, something after the harpsichord that, that went quiet and loud. And when I say loud, it's like really tinkly and, and really not loud at all. Um, so, so it's almost like a toy piano, you know. Um, it did not sound heavy and, and, and thick. So um, what I hadn't realized is that C.P. Bach had written in dynamics into this piece. So um, uh, 
in bar 22, if I go from bar 21, there, um, th there's no dynamic there, but to me, this is dramatic. You know, it wants to be bam, da 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 da. Then there's a quiet, which I hadn't realized, but oops. Um, um, and then he writes in forte. So if I go from um, bar 21 and play it just the way that C.P. Buff wrote it um, and try and give it this kind of drama and, and exaggerations of dynamics. Um, so, oops. Just doesn't sound very convincing to me. Um, so one thing that I feel it really needs is um, an octave in the left hand in bar 22. So. That is just so much meatier. I mean, what do you prefer hearing? Do you prefer hearing? Or do you prefer... You know, I know that I prefer that octave. Um, and actually, it's not completely wrong, <laughs> if you want to say wrong, because in, um, in C.P. Bach's time, the harpsichords, and this might have been performed on a harpsichord because not everyone would have had access to a forte piano. So... Um, um, harpsichords uh, very often had two sets of keyboards where one keyboard was doubled down the octave. So having that kind of sound might not be like completely unauthentic. Anyway, I have to very briefly stop the video and then start it going again uh, because it only records in short chunks uh, as I learned yesterday. <laughs> so I'll be right back here very quickly. Okay, and so I'm back. So we've had these octaves. Um, we we want to keep that octave even though it's quiet. And then especially here, so much drama, so much drama in this note. So um, the problem is that when we get to, especially to bar 24, we've got this on the modern piano with a, with a, lot, of, a lot of depth, a lot of oomph. And then we play this note, which is clearly supposed to have a lot of emotional tension. So we've got... Um, this note doesn't work. It's just pathetic. It's just, it just doesn't sound great. So one reason why we do trills is to emphasize the tension that, that we have in the notes, to add more expression to it. So here... And that's why I did that little trill, which one friend of mine said was jazzy and not baroque, which was not the effect I was going for. So bear in mind that, you know, some people will go, oh, I'm not sure about that because it's just not what, what people are used to hearing. I personally do think that this is in the style of, of what C.P. Buck would have done and someone else sort of said, yeah, yeah, I think that sounds quite authentic. So bear in mind, this will divide people. Um, so, you know, I think it's worth it because, you know, do, 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 do I want to hear... Or do I want to hear... Well, it's all down to taste, and my taste says I prefer that. And, um, you know, something I'm trying to um, uh, say over and over and over again to my students, I think when it comes to classical music especially, there's this notion that there is a correct, proper way to play something. Um, like there is, you know, when you learn the piece, there is just a proper, correct way to do it. And this is just totally, totally not the case. If this was the case, we wouldn't need, you know, hundreds of thousands of different concert pianists who all have their own idea about what to do with it. And when it comes to Baroque music, um, you have a lot more freedom or should have a lot more freedom. And recently, you know, um, people are much more interested in being authentic in what people would have done authentically in the time. Well, part of that is you have freedom. You have freedom to improvise and embellish and do what you want with it. So in a way, I'm being very authentic with it. But I think it's really important. And it's, you know, I, I keep coming back to this over and over again with my students. Lose this limited belief that, that there is a correct way to do something. There, there is no such thing as correct in classical music. Um, I mean, obviously, when you get beyond Baroque music, you, you sort of have to play the notes that are there. But even within that, you have a lot of freedom within that, even when you play all the... Anyway, I'm 
that stuff for another video. So, um, um, what else have we got? I think, you know, that's pretty much it. If you, if you do that, you've got everything that you need to, to get a good mark. I, I, I think a distinction, you, you can easily get a distinction with this piece just by playing legato. There's one more thing, one more thing that I was going to mention. In bar five, um, uh, there was a temptation, and I've seen this in my students, there's a temptation to, to emphasize beats one and three, very understandably. So you've got... And, and it does feel like, intuitively, you want to emphasize... And it took me a couple of days to go, I'm just not feeling it with this. What, what am I doing wrong? Why does this not work? And then, in my opinion, what this needs, the third beat needs to go softer. So we've got... And, and it goes sweet, very tender on that note. It's going to sound a bit weird, but if I go right from the beginning and go fast and then add that, you'll see exactly what I mean, hopefully. Okay, I overdid it. I overdid it a bit too much, but... Yeah, yeah blah, blah, blah. So... Um, da, 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 and you can just linger for a fraction, for a fraction, just before that note. Within the, the bounds of good taste. So anyway, that, that's, that's everything that you need to do very, very well with this. Now, uh, I'm going to add a little bit more of sort of how to take this to what, what I think is a bit of a more advanced level. Um, because I don't know about you guys, but what what does this piece express? What is it about? What what's what? If it was a person, uh, wh who is this person? What are they feeling? What are they doing? Um, and to me, the way that I usually hear this, it's like um, it, it's just it, I I don't get any sensation of character. It's just like you know, teenage boy going, let me play as loudly and as fast as I can and show off how fast my fingers move. Um, You know, it's like, literally, look, look at what I can do, look at what I can play. It doesn't express anything. So when I'm looking at this, it's like, um, yeah, I, I think it needs to... For, for one thing, anyway, I think it sounds flashier. If you want to just sound flash, I think it sounds much flashier when you pull with the fingers. So let me, let me just play the two ways and, and contrast it. Do you prefer this? Etc. Etc. Do you prefer this? Um, and bear in mind, um, I need to be really, really warmed up to to play this because it's kind of a new technique. It's a new style for me to to play, and it's it's difficult. So um, you know, I massively prefer it that way. And to me, it's like it's like a scurrying animal. It, it means something. It's like, oh, da, 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 da. Um, or like, you know, in one lesson I likened it to the, um, to the hair, the, the, the hair from Alice in Wonderland who was rushing around being late for everything. It, 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 then, you know, and, and, and also the tone. we want to make a beautiful tone rather than just it's not beautiful um, you know this is just my opinion um, so to do this to to get that up to speed um, I've redone all of the fingerings um, in the right hand so so I'm avoiding the fourth and fifth fingers as much as possible because if we're pulling with our fingers like this it's very, very difficult to pull with fingers four and five and have independence from each other. So I've, I've redone all of the fingering. You can watch my YouTube video um, of the performance, slow it down and see which fingers I'm using. So you practice it very slowly, very patiently, and you exaggerate, you exaggerate these, these flicks 
So Now, the thing is, if you take it too fast, too soon, you find that you're not exaggerating that flicking. And what I saw with one student was all this effort. Um, so it's, you're doing all of these, this pulling with the fingers, but it still sounds legato. So you're just working, you're working 20 times harder to get the same sound that, that you would have got before just playing legato. So, so you, you have to make sure that there's a gap between the notes. Now, when you really speed it up, even if you do it really diligently and very, very slowly speed it up, it's never gonna be fully staccato. And if you watch the Synthesia video that I've recorded, you'll see that they're not all completely staccato. But because I've practiced it this way, the, the effect kind of carries through. So, so basically, just do not speed it up um, uh, um, unless you're absolutely sure that, that you've got um, this flicking motion. And, and it needs to sound even. And I struggled for, for quite a few days with that. And in fact, still struggle. It's the thumb, the thumb, because the thumb doesn't flick in the same way. It's so hard to get that even. Actually, that's not bad, that's not bad. Oh, that's good, that's good, that's fine. So usually when I, when I play that, that's a bit hit and miss, but obviously all of my recording the tutorials yesterday has got this <laughs> under my fingers a bit better now. So, um, uh, yeah, the other thing as well is I, I've seen my students think that they're exaggerating and they play like this. That's not exaggerating. It's got to be... Um, so so I, uh, hopefully you can see my, my, my fingers clearly. That's exaggerated. This is not exaggerated. And when you speed that up, you're not going to feel that flicking. So I don't perform it like that, but I practice it like that. It's so important to get this feeling under your fingers. Then you're never really going to get it unless you then do the same thing with shifting accents. So let me do it in threes. And I'm doing it way too fast. That is actually way too fast because I can hear that one note I missed and some aren't quite enough. Yeah, yeah, and, and even then I'm, I'm using the wrong hands, the wrong fingers. You have to go slow, you have to go really slowly. I mean, that was too fast for me. So, you know, like really, ooh. That's still too fast. And that's still too fast. So anyway, you know, this, this is one way that you can get it up to speed. And then when I get to bar five, I add pedal. Um, so, so we've gone from. Uh, I'm, that was a bit over exaggerated. I suddenly went really romantic. You, you don't want to pull it around that much, but. And then here in bar seven, uh, I'm a violinist and a viola player. And when you play violin, there's a technique called spiccato where you bounce, you bounce the bow off the string and, and then play very fast, da 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 da, da. Um, And this passage here, bar seven and eight, reminds me of a lot of um, um, uh, spiccato passages on the violin. Like I'm thinking of the, the famous uh, getting towards the, the climax halfway through the Bach Chacon, where it has this kind of, you're going over several strings with, with this bouncing the bow technique. So something that, that I like here is you throw down the right hand and bounce the finger off that first note and then come up with the thumb. So, so. And then I like this in, in bar eight, I like ba, ba, ba. So we've got, uh, 
ta 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 pa pa nan uh, yeah now that's a completely new technique for me so i'd need to practice that quite a lot more to, to get it a little bit more dependable uh, and a bit more even but um yeah, yeah, there are times when, when I can get that relatively even, but I need to have practiced it for, for a little bit. Um, that's pretty advanced. Um, or you can just go... Um, um, and what I'm doing there is I'm doing like a, a bouncing basketball thing with my right hand. So imagine you're dribbling a, a basketball super, super near to the ground and your wrist is, is very, very agile. And then I'm doing... Um, so, so that comes from the wrist. Um, uh, and then the left hand. I, I'm okay with it semi-legato. Um, and um, yeah, from bars 14, you can make the left hand very, very short. Um, what, what have we got? Yeah. And so from there onwards, oh, and from bar, bar 13, I don't mind the, the, the left hand. Um, uh, yeah, so the left hand, you can make it quite short. It can be, it can be a, a beat long. Use your intuition with what you like with this. But the right hand for me is legato. And then left hand very short. And the right hand is fine being legato. And then um, short. And then... Well, a bit longer, a bit longer on this note. Linger on that right hand note in bar 17. Uh, blah, 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 blah. So I think that, um, oh yes, uh, the, the trills. The trills in, in bar 22 onwards. Bear in mind that Baroque trills, they start on the upper note and on the beat. So if you do add a trill, you want to go one, two, three, and then one, two, and I do the trills quickly so that all the semiquavers or 16th notes for people who, who think of it that way, um, carry on. So, so it's as if I'm going da 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 but, and I do it quick. Now, not all of you are gonna be able to do that at grade six level. So if you can't do that, then, you know, don't do the trill. <laughs> but, so if you do the trill, it's gotta be fast. One, two, um, and in fact, you know, I'm a little bit embarrassed because I'm, my trills are fine. But when I looked back at my recording on YouTube, uh, this particular trill, um, I actually didn't, um, didn't play, I didn't connect with that note properly, with that A flat. So you can see it in the synthesia. It's a little bit embarrassing, but you know, we, we can't get perfection. Um, but I, I, it's, it's annoying, but anyway, so one, two, one, two, one, two. Um, so it's got to be on the beat, not before the beat, and it's got to start on the note above. And I do really like that. And then, um, yeah, this this ending, um, what I liked. Um, and then, um, okay, there is a, a time when you do not have to do the trill from above. I, I do a trill here. If the note before the note you're going to trill on is already the note above, then you don't start from the note above, then you start on the note and then go up and back. So we've got, I'm going to trill on the D, but I'm already playing an E flat. So then I go D, E flat, D uh, to trill on the D. And then I'm going to trill on the C, which means I start on the D. And I make it a long trill. So it's basically C, E flat, um, trill, trill starting on the D. Now, if I go from bar 31, um, um, it, it takes a bit of practice. Let, let me go again. And I love that as a way of ending it. Um, uh, as I was saying before, I think that that is in the style of what C.P. Buck would have wanted. He wanted it suddenly cut short through the bar um, and all this trilling makes it sound like this is the end, this has tension, rather than just like we've just suddenly gone off the cliff and suddenly just fall, you know? 
um, it's like it's like a cartoon person with the, with the feet still going and going huh? um, it's so much better I love that I love that ending so I think that's pretty much everything that, that I wanted to cover um, um, I hope it doesn't show that I'm like, oh my God, this is the fourth time I've recorded this in, in, in a very short amount of time and then up very late trying to, anyway. So um, please do show your appreciation uh, if you liked it, if this is useful. Press like, press subscribe, um, uh, watch some of the other tutorials, uh, leave comments. Um, if there are any other pieces you'd like to see comments on, uh, do please let me know. Um, and um, see you at the next tutorial or the next piece. And thanks very much for listening. Bye.